African Americans have lived and worked in Winchester since the earliest years. Most came as slaves. By 1753, there were more than 600 slaves recorded in Frederick County. They worked in the fields alongside Scots-Irish and German farmers, growing produce for the household and grains for the market. But these small family farms did not fit into the slave system, and the area's many Quakers, Baptists, and Methodists denounced slavery. Some owners freed their slaves. The first freedom certificate recorded in Frederick County was granted to Patty Robinson, age 18, on September 5, 1796. Other slaves worked for their freedom. Randall Evans, for example, owned an oyster bar on Loudoun Street, and with profit from his business, he was able to purchase his family's freedom. Between 1830 and 1840, Winchester's free black population grew by one-third. The idea that Winchester was a mecca for free blacks persists in oral tradition. In the years before the Civil War, the number of free blacks in Winchester was proportionally greater than that of the state as a whole. As a market center, the city needed skilled workers. The 1850 census shows that while the majority of free blacks in Winchester were employed as laborers, many were craftsmen. Women in the community often worked also, employed as washerwomen, servants, or even midwives. After emancipation, Winchester continued to offer opportunities for work. In 1869, an office of the Freedmen's Bureau, a U.S. governmental agency designed to aid and protect newly freed black people, opened in downtown Winchester. The office helped freedmen find work, made sure they were paid, and even set up a small school for educating their children. Later city directories continue to portray a vigorous and self-sufficient black community. African Americans were barbers and confectioners, stonemasons and practical nurses. They ran tourist homes and hotels, beauty parlors and funeral parlors. They drove taxi cabs and repaired cars. Some were doctors and dentists. Many were clergymen. Like people everywhere, the African Americans of Winchester worked hard at their occupations. They supported their churches and social organizations, and made sure their children were as well cared for and as well educated as possible. African Americans of Winchester contributed when they could, left when they had to, and in general looked out for one another. Arguably the most successful African American from Winchester in the early 19th century, Robert Oreck was a slave born in Winchester in the early 1800s. He started his own business before the Civil War. After freedom, Oreck became an African Methodist Episcopal minister. Ultimately, Oreck made a fortune in the livery business. He owned livery stables on Cecil and Washington Streets, two farms in Frederick County, and other property. However, Oreck is more renowned for his generosity and community spirit than for his wealth. At his own expense, he erected a black church in Stephen City, Oreck Chapel, and his family donated his land for Oreck Cemetery on Valley Avenue. According to the Winchester Evening Star, when Robert Oreck died on July 8, 1902, he was the richest black man in Winchester and the black community's first minister. By today's market value, his wealth would have far exceeded a half a million dollars. Oreck Cemetery is still used today. Shown are the graves of the Browns, a prominent black family in the community in the early 20th century. All six children of Charlie C. and Maria Fairfax Brown became doctors or pharmacists, but all had to leave Winchester to study. Several ended up practicing or teaching in Pittsburgh, whereas others worked in Washington, D.C. Dr. Sarah Winifred Brown distinguished herself as an educator and doctor, as the first woman to serve on Howard University's Board of Trustees, and as a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt. Religion has always been an integral part of the local African-American community. John Mann United Methodist Church is the oldest organized black church in Winchester, founded in 1857 at Market Street Methodist Church under the leadership of Reverend Robert Oreck. The church's current building was completed in 1858 and named for John Mann, who had promoted Methodism among blacks and donated land for the church building. On December 26, 1858, the new church was dedicated in a ceremony led by two white ministers and two black ministers. In 1893, John Mann became independent from Market Street Methodist Church and became a part of the Virginia District in 1968 as it is today. Another African American church in downtown Winchester is Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel, a Baptist church, was organized in 1866 by Reverend Nathan Cook Brackett, 
a white Baptist minister who moved to the Winchester area around 1865. The church moved to its current site on Braddock Street in 1869, where services were held until 1890, when the building was destroyed by fire. Finally, the church was rebuilt in 1893 on the original site. Since then, the church has flourished. Shiloh Church is much older than its current building. It met before the Civil War as the Old School Congregational Baptist Church of Color at the Old Stone Church. The congregation rented the building, with each of 285 people buying shares for 50 cents each. In 1911, the congregation obtained its current church property here on North Kent Street. St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church, organized in 1867, was one of the first 50 AME congregations chartered in the country. The building was constructed in stages, and services were held in the basement until the sanctuary was built. The vestibule and bell tower followed, which today houses a 650-pound bell. In February 1968, the Winchester Frederick County Historical Society recognized the structure as a historic site, and it remains the only designated landmark in Winchester owned by African American people. The first public school for black children in Winchester and the surrounding area was established in 1875. Called the Winchester Colored School, it was located at the Old Stone Presbyterian Church on Piccadilly Street, the oldest church building in Winchester, built in 1788. The Winchester School Board acquired a 99-year lease on the Old Stone Church from the Black Baptist for a lump sum of $1. In the lease contract, the school board agreed to make repairs and turn the church into a suitable school building. School board minutes of May 17, 1878, show the repairs totaled $446 a relatively large sum in those days. In 1916, the school's name was changed to Frederick Douglass School to honor the black abolitionist. By that time, however, the school was beginning to be overcrowded. At its peak, 183 students were pressed into the three classrooms that made up the school. There were only four teachers, and students had to attend in half-day shifts. The building was heated by a single wood stove that the students themselves maintained and according to a 1924 Winchester Evening Star article, provided inadequate ventilation and light, and was far below the state requirements in sanitation. The article also reported that the school children had no place to play but the open and dangerous Piccadilly Street, one of the main arteries leading into the city. In 1924, the black community took action to protest the overcrowding of the school. The Winchester Evening Star reported that John Mann Methodist Episcopal Church was filled to its capacity last night with school patrons and taxpayers of all description of the city of Winchester who were uncompromisingly bent on improving the housing condition of their public school. Following the meeting, the Winchester School Board received a petition stating that if the city didn't provide adequate facilities for the education of black children, there would be future meetings and protests. Finally, construction of a new school building began in 1925 at a cost of more than $30,000. The money for the school came from two sources. First, from Judge John Hanley's bequest that was used to build the then all-white Hanley High School, and second, from the State Literary Fund. Two years later, on September 5, 1927, the cornerstone of the new school building on North Kent Street was laid. The Winchester Evening Star reported, the colored population of Winchester and widely spread territory around it had a gala day yesterday in this city when the cornerstone of the new Douglas School building on North Kent Street was laid with appropriate ceremonies at which the leading white speakers of the community paid flowing tribute to the colored people themselves and lauded the efforts of the Hanley trustees and the school board of the city in rearing an imposing structure for the education of the colored youth of the city. A parade which was nearly a mile long and in which over 1,000 people participated preceded the Cornerstone Lang's exercises at the school building. Classes began in the new building on November 1, 1927. 150 students and six teachers marched from Old Stone Church to the new school here on Kent Street. At the time, Douglas School consisted of six classrooms, a library, a principal's office, a storeroom, and restrooms with showers. It was described as one of the most complete edifices for educating black children in the state of Virginia. At first, Douglas School only offered kindergarten through ninth grade, but by 1954 it was a full-service, 12-grade regional high school, 
serving blacks of Winchester City as well as Frederick, Shenandoah, and Warren counties. Pal Gibson, principal from 1916 to 1940, helped shape Douglas School. Gibson began his career in education, teaching at small private schools operated from different homes. All the while, he was taking more classes in subjects such as rhetoric, geometry, and astronomy. Along with being an educator, Gibson was a poet and a playwright. He published a pamphlet of poems entitled Grave and Comic Rhymes, and wrote two plays, Jake Among the Indians and King of the Mandingos. Pal Gibson's son, Willard P. Gibson, was also a leader of the Winchester community. Around 1930, he opened his own print shop in the basement of the family home at 119 East Lane. Along with printing wedding announcements, brochures, poetry, and a few books, in July 1939, Willard Gibson began publishing the area's first black newspaper, the Virginia Informer. The paper's motto was, we cover Virginia like the sky covers the earth. The four-page paper reported general news, items of special importance to the local African-American community, and upcoming events. The editorial from the first edition describes the paper as an experiment whereby we hope to find out if colored Winchester and Northern Virginia want and will support a Negro Weekly. In this edition, the editorial continues, we bring to you comments and criticisms of Winchester's leading citizens. Douglas School flourished in its first decades, gaining new pupils and teachers, new classrooms, and new facilities. In 1954, however, with the Supreme Court's ruling on Brown versus the Board of Education, came the decree that all public schools in America were to be integrated. Like other southern cities, Winchester was slow to begin this process. Minutes from the Winchester School Board meeting of July 20th, 1959, state that, based upon the assumption that white pupils prefer to attend school with other white pupils, and that Negro pupils prefer to attend school with other Negro pupils, the policy of building assignments for pupils in former date of this resolution shall continue. Meanwhile, local African American community sought to integrate other areas of Winchester's community life. Led by the diplomatic effort of persons such as Garfield Prather and William Brown, local blacks struggled to gain equal status not only in the eyes of local law, but also in the eyes of local society. In 1949, men and women met at Brown's Barbershop on Cameron Street to discuss strategies for opening the Hanley Library to black patrons, and eventually formed the local branch of the NAACP. At first, the Hanley Board was willing to allow blacks to borrow books only one day a week. However, with much persistence, local African Americans eventually won full use of the library's facilities. After integrating the library, the community moved on to the commercial sectors of life. Black leaders convinced white retailers each to hire one black employee so that all area stores would be equally integrated. And after meeting with the owners, young blacks went to white-owned restaurants and groups and demanded, and eventually received, service. Next, local blacks turned their attention to achieving integration in the Winchester school system. In 1962, a group of black students sued the Winchester City School Board for transfer from Douglas School to Hanley High School. The student suit was not granted, but the school board's answer to the suit shows that at the time, eight years after the Supreme Court's ruling on Brown, there were no non-white students at Hanley, and there were no white students at Douglas. Finally, in 1963, Winchester City Schools offered select Douglas students the opportunity to attend Hanley High School. And eventually, by September 1966, Winchester schools were fully integrated. The process, although not without conflict, went relatively smoothly. A mayor's commission was set up, with black and white members all working to make integration an easy, lasting, and thorough change. A few years after integration, Douglas School reopened as a Winchester Intermediate School, and grades six and seven were taught to black and white students alike. Later, the name reverted back to Douglas School, when it became one of the city's elementary schools. In 1987, having witnessed great changes in a community and a society, Douglas School on North Kent Street was officially closed. It was the smallest school building in Winchester, and second oldest in operation only to Hanley High School. Although the building was outdated and overcrowded, the local community was still very attached to the school. At the request of the Douglas Alumni Association, the name was kept alive in the city. Winchester City Public Schools named their new elementary school Frederick Douglas, and today, the old Douglas School here on North Kent Street is used as a community center. 
Perhaps one reason for the great amount of community support behind Douglas School is the graduates themselves. Many went on to achieve both local and national recognition. Jefferson W. Lewis, for example, became the fire chief of Washington, D.C. Benjamin Brown Jr. tap danced on the Ted Mack Original Amateur Hour, touring with Mack for seven years. Helen M. Cartwright became the first black registered nurse at the Winchester Medical Center. And John Kirby became a nationally acclaimed jazz musician. Kirby was born Johnny Kirk on December 31st, 1908. At a young age, he learned how to play the piano, and Pal Gibson, at the time principal of Douglas School, taught Kirby to play the trombone. In 1926, Kirby moved to Baltimore to play the tuba, and then on to New York City, where he played with Fletcher Henderson's band, the premier black jazz band of the 1930s. While in New York, he recorded with jazz greats such as Benny Goodman. Ultimately, he formed his own jazz sextet, described as the biggest little band in the land, Kirby had a nationwide radio show and gave a concert at Carnegie Hall. He recorded with Decca, Columbia, and other record labels. His music is still popular today among jazz listeners. Another famous Winchester African American was Spotswood Poles. Poles, a baseball player, was born on November 7, 1886 at 30 Fremont Street. Known as the Black Tie Cobb, Poles is remembered as the fastest man who ever played in the Negro Leagues. He was also quite a hitter. In 1911, playing for the New York Lincoln Giants, he batted a 440 and stole 41 bases in 60 games. In 10 exhibition games against major league teams, he had an amazing 6'10 batting average. During World War I, Poles enlisted in the 369th Infantry and earned five battle stars and a Purple Heart fighting in France, where he also organized a baseball team. Retiring from sports in 1923, he returned to Winchester to drive a taxi. Winchester's local African-American community holds a vast number of amazing, inspiring stories, and it has been a privilege and an honor for me to research them. However, there are many that still need to be told. One such story is that of Judy Humbert. Miss Humbert, a graduate from the segregated Douglas School, has since gone on to become the first black member of the Winchester City School Board. She has served on the boards of numerous community organizations and has become the unofficial historian of Winchester's African-American community. All members of the community look to her for much more than historical information, however. Miss Humbert has become a symbol of the strength, spirit, and vitality of the local black community. I hope young Afro-American students who view this video realize from the story of the Brown family that anything is possible if you set your goals high and work hard. I hope all students will be encouraged to get involved in worthwhile projects that satisfy you and benefit others.